we're going to go ahead and do part three of Invincible No Evil Shall Befall You. And let's just do a quick rereading of Psalm 91. So this teaching is all about Psalm 91. And, and again, you know, Psalm 91 can be summarized in one little sentence that Jesus spoke. So we'll just start with this little sentence here. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. This one little phrase here, this sentence fragment, it kind of summarizes the entirety of Psalm 91. So with, with Jesus, we get the little snippet that's perfect. And then Psalm 91 gives us a lot more context to be very specific, which is also helpful for our faith. So we'll read through this, and then today we're going to talk about verses 14 through 16, because we've already talked about 1 through 13. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to protect you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. All right, so we've talked about in the prior two teachings, um, the whole first section there, verses 1 through 13. And today we're going to talk about verses 14 through 16. And when you look at this psalm, the, kind of the first part is from the perspective of David, and the second part is it's God speaking, right? So we're going to talk about the God speaking part. So in verse 14, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. And something always to keep in mind when you read the Bible, remember that every promise of God, the answer is yes and amen. And anytime you find the words, I will, I shall, I will, I shall, you have found a promise of God. Okay, so these are promises here. Uh, but usually with a promise, there's also some requirement of some kind. Right? So it's a, the requirement here is because he has set his love upon me. Okay, so we have to first set our love upon God, and then these other things, um, then these other promises are valid in that context that we have set our love upon him. Well, this little phrase here, set his love upon me, that's one word in Hebrew, which is chashak. Ch ch I have no idea if I'm saying it right, but it's chashak. And chashak means to love. It means to, to be attached to, to long for, to cling to, to have a delight for and, um, you know, I just like that, to be attached to God, you know, to have a delight for God, right? So this is like a clingy, a clingy kind of love, like you cling to God, like you, you know, he's like your daddy and you just grab a hold of him and you don't let go of him, you know? So it's just an affectionate, strong kind of attached love, clingy, delightful love, all right? And so, so let us, let that be us attached to God. And in fact, you can even see in another translation, it uses that, exa that exact same terminology. In the concordant literal version, it says, Because he is attached to me, I shall deliver him. I shall make him impregnable, for he knows my name. All right, so we'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, so we want to be attached to God, and then these promises are true for us, are valid. 
I will deliver him. I will set him on high. Well, the other word I want to look at is the word set on high. Because to me, when I first read the scripture, that's just not that exciting sounding to me. Like being delivered, you know, that means to be rescued. That means if there's a dangerous situation, God's going to save you. To be delivered means that if there's a plague coming, God's going to keep you safe from it. Being delivered means if, um, I don't know, if the enemy is going to drop a bomb on, on your city, you know, God's going to rescue you from the city so you don't get, you know, bombed upon or whatever. So, you know, we all understand the word deliver. It just means to be rescued, to be saved, to be kept safe. So that's exciting and that's good. But what does it mean to be set on high? I mean, to me, that's just not that impressive <laughs> sounding. You know, in the midst of Psalm 91, that was pretty unimpressive to me until I looked at the definition. And this word, I will set on high, is the Hebrew word sagab. And when you look at this word, it's a super exciting word. This means to be high, to be inaccessibly high, to be too high for capture, to be safely set on high, to set securely on high. Okay, so get the picture here. When he says that he's going to set you on high, that means he's going to lift you up out of reach of the devil. The devil cannot touch you. Evil cannot touch you. You are out of harm's way. It cannot get to you. The devil cannot reach you. The devil cannot touch you. His works can't touch you. You are in a place of safety held up by the hand of God or by the hand of an angel out of harm's way. I mean, that is perfect, invincible protection out of reach of the devil. Untouchable, invincible, unkillable. I mean, that's amazing. To be to be too high for capture, to be safely set on high. The the enemy can't get to you. So when you when you look at the definition, this is pretty this is pretty amazing. This is one of those invincible verses, right? I will set you on high out of reach of the devil. I will set you too high for the devil to get to. You are inaccessible. You can't be reached. You can't be touched. You can't be harmed. The workers of the devil can't touch you. The devil himself can't touch you. The works of the devil cannot touch you. You are securely, safely on high. That's amazing. So that becomes a really exciting verse. Okay, now um, we already saw that there's one requirement in this verse, which is to be attached to God, to love him in a clingy, attached sort of way. The other is we need to know the name of God. Okay? And the name of God is Father. That's what Jesus told us. The name of God is Father. That is the only name of God Jesus revealed to us. The only other thing, um, he had a nickname for God, which was Abba, which is like saying, you know, Papa or Daddy, right? So the, ne the official name of God is Father. That is the name that Jesus revealed to us. Okay, and when you think about that, um, if we know the name of God, you know, if we know God as Father, then we know a lot about Him too. Without even knowing any scripture, if somebody said, hey, the name of God is Father, then you can think about all the amazing things that fathers do for their children to the best of their ability. Um, and those are the things that God can, can and does do for us, but He can do perfectly, whereas earthly fathers can do only in a limited manner. So what does a father do? A father will try and keep his children safe and sound. A father will try and rescue, deliver his children from trouble. Um, a mother, AJ, will try and rescue her son from trouble. Um, you know, as parents, we, as a father or a mother, you know, but in this context, God's name is Father. So as a father, you know, a father will do anything in his power to try and protect his children, to keep them safe and sound, to, to get them out of harm's way, to get them in a place that's inaccessible to the evil one, get them out of the bar, get them out of the dangerous place, get them away from the dangerous friends, get them in a place that's inaccessible to the enemy. You know, that's what any earthly father would love to do for their children, right? So an, an earthly father loves his kids, an earthly father wants to protect his kids, an earthly father wants his children healthy and protected from disease, and a, an earthly father wants his children to prosper in life, prosper in health, prosper in their soul, prosper in everything, and be protected, right? So you know so much about God just by knowing that one word, Father. Just think about what would a perfect father on earth do for his children, and that's exactly who God is. And so 
it's easy to be clingy and attached and in love with God when you know him by his name, Father, which is the name that Jesus revealed to us. Amen? So, let's, um, let's read through these. So, what name of God did Jesus reveal to us? Jesus revealed that the true name of God is Father. He said that we would know the love of God by his name, Father. And Jesus clarified the name and the image of God from the Old Testament. And Jesus perfectly revealed the Father to us. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay, so Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If we want to know who God really is, then we need to look at Jesus. If we want to know who Father God really is, we need to look at Jesus. What did Jesus say? What did he do? What didn't he do? And when we look at Jesus in the Gospels, then we're going to have a perfect image of Father. Okay? So if we transform our image of Father God to be just like Jesus exemplified in the Gospels, then it will be easy to love God and trust in Him. So think about Jesus. Jesus never harmed anyone. Jesus never made anyone sick. Jesus never put a curse upon, uh, upon someone. Jesus never brought trials and tribulations upon anyone. Jesus never punished or retaliated. Jesus was always merciful, he was forgiving, and he was loving. Jesus was always a healer, always a blesser, always a savior, always a redeemer, a provider, a protector. And Jesus is the exact image of Father God upon this earth. So if you want to know who God is, you have to look at Jesus. And there's your perfect picture of who Father God is. Amen? And think about, think about some things Jesus did also. You know, um, Jesus is the redeemer from law and curse. He's not the author of it. He's the rescuer, the ransomer, the redeemer from law and curse. You know, it is not the will of God that anyone be, you know, have a curse come upon them. In fact, what did Jesus do? When he knew that all these terrible things, these terrible curses were going to come upon Jerusalem, Jesus, as he was approaching the city, it says he wept over Jerusalem because his will was not being done. His will was that, you know, so many times I wanted to gather you under my wings as, as a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. And so Jesus was crying. He was crying because he wanted to save them, but they wouldn't have him. And so this terrible curse came upon him. So it's not his will for curse to come upon anyone. He's a redeemer from curse. And he cries over those, even who reject him, whom affliction is coming upon. So the heart of God is much softer and warmer and more loving and, and more redeemer and rescuer in nature than we've ever really imagined. And so we need to work on our imagination. We need to work on our image of God. And the more perfect our image of God, the more we see his beauty and his love and all these qualities here in point number six, then we're going to receive more and more from him things that Jesus paid for. We're going to walk in full salvation more profoundly. We're going to be able to teach the good will of God more accurately in a way that imparts faith to people and love for God in people. Amen? So what we need to do is we need to put our love and our trust in Father God and we will be safe and sound. We will be protected. We will be preserved and we will be out of the devil's reach. Amen. And again, remember, always remember, the word of God is belief and speech activated. We have to believe it and we have to speak it and that activates it. Believe, speak, and then we receive. Okay, verse 15. He, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Okay, again, we see in this passage, we see shall, will, will, will. Every time you find shall and will, you have found promises of God. So this, this Psalm 91, it is filled with promises. And so it's a super amazing psalm. It's just filled with amazing promises. And here we go again. He shall call upon me, I will answer him. And that means that when we call upon our Father, when we pray, he will answer our prayers. And we've heard multiple examples of that in the testimonies we heard today. He will answer our prayers. Some things happen faster than others. 
you know of course we aspire everything to be immediate who doesn't right but we have to um, we have to accept things that take longer in time and when it involves the will of other people those things may have a tendency to take longer right because people can be stubborn and they can resist the 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 will of God and so the will of a person can be slower to move than other things right but let us just realize that all of our prayers they shall be answered he said we shall call and he didn't say I will maybe answer he said he will answer okay so he will respond to our prayers and let's remember that Jesus said multiple times that if we ask we will receive if we ask for anything in his name it will be done for us Okay, so like, for example, in Matthew 7, 7 to 8, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Okay, so we need to change our mindset so that we're not thinking that there are some, we need to delete from our thinking that there will be unanswered prayers. Because if we think that God's going to answer some prayers, but not all of them, then we have a, a doubt that's always going to be nagging at us. But we have many scriptures that tell us we should expect all of our prayers to be answered. And if something doesn't get answered, then you know generally it's going to be on us. Because Jesus said, if we believe, then whatever we ask for believing, we will receive. And so, generally speaking, if there's something that we ask for that we do not receive, then um, the likely problems would be we weren't believing or we were believing for a while but it was something that took some time and we allowed doubt to creep in and we changed our mind over time it could be that um, I had another idea I just lost it I'll see if it comes back to me okay but generally speaking if something's not answered okay I know what it was if we're praying for something that's not God's will then we should not expect that to be answered. So we need to make sure that we know the will of God and we pray for the will of God. And we need to remember what the Holy Spirit said, that every promise of God, the answer is yes and amen. And so we should expect things like protection related, deliverance related, trouble related. We should expect those to come true because these are promises. I will, I will, I will. He shall. Okay, so those are promises. Again, in John 14, 13 to 14. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. Promise. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's a promise. Okay, so he's telling us that, you know, if we're... And there, there's more context if you read the chapter, right? So we need to be born again in Christ. And we need to be walking in love. So there's a few requirements. Um, those should be things that we're normally, naturally doing anyway as sons of God. So when we ask for things in the name of Jesus, He will do it. That's a promise. And let me just show you this passage. Let's go to... Let's get an easier version. Okay, um, so let's just read in verse 19. It says, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Sylvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. In him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Okay, let me just read a King James version of the same thing, which is a little more emphatic. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, to the glory of God. All the promises of God in Jesus Christ are yes. Amen? So that is that is amazing. All the promises of God 
in Jesus Christ are yes. The answer is yes. So as long as we know the will of God and we're praying for that, then we should have a delightful, amazing prayer life with just boom, answer prayer after answer prayer after answer prayer because we know the promises and we pray accordingly. Okay, one more. In John chapter 16, it says, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you, will, promise. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, promise, that your joy may be full. Okay, so we have all these passages and there's even more than that. So we have Psalm 91, verse 15, that says we should expect our prayers to be answered. He will answer. We have Matthew 7, ask, it will be given. We have John 14, whatever you ask, I will do. We have John 16, ask the Father and he will give. So it's like God is telling us time and time again, you need to expect your prayers to be answered because I'm telling you, I'm going to answer your prayers. So we need to have just steadfast faith. We need to pray, believing, expecting that God will do. Um, what he said, which is to answer our prayers, because he's promised us many times. Amen? All right, now let's go on to the rest of the verse. Let's talk about point three. God will be with us in all trouble, and he will rescue us from it. Okay? I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Okay, so not only will he rescue us from the problem, but he will also honor us or you could say glorify us in the process and remember that our father turns all things to good for those who love him okay so we have Romans 8 28 which says and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called who are the called according to his purpose okay so he says that you know he's not just gonna leave us in trouble but he's going he will promise I will rescue you I will deliver you I will save you from whatever that trouble is I will save you and I'm not just gonna save you but I'm gonna honor you and that means something amazing and surprising is gonna happen and so let me give two quick examples and then a longer example so the two quick examples um, I had two co-workers uh, a man and a lady and both of them were just suddenly let go from their jobs like in the case of the lady the work that her team was doing, it got moved to Mexico, and so she lost her job. In the case of the gentleman, um, the devil just came upon his boss, and he just fired him for, for no reason at all. And it, it was just crazy. There was no justification. There was no transition of work. It was just some crazy, out-of-the-blue thing the devil uh, caused to happen. Well, in both cases, we prayed in agreement, commanded the devil to leave, and and called forth a good and godly job to come forth and in both of these cases um, both people they got hired back at the same company that they got let go from they got hired back at the same company and both of them also had a promotion I'm like boom that's amazing both of them two people so you see he delivered them from their trouble but he honored them you know the devil came to steal kill and destroy and it's not, you know, God says, watch this, the devil's going to come mess with you, but you're going to get upgraded after he does. And so these two people, they got upgraded. They got better jobs with more pay and job, job grade increase. Boom. That's awesome. Okay. Well, let me give a, my personal example. Last year, COVID came and then we did this 15% um, pay reduction. And, you know, that's the devil stealing from me. So that was already working against a promise of God that I shall not, you know, I'm protected. You know, I'm not going to have the devil stealing from me. This is illegal. He can't do that. So, so anyway, so all the company, we had our little pay reduction and, um, and then I, I got laid off like back on August 7th, I was shocked beyond belief and they, they let me go because, um, of cost, cost savings purposes, me and three of my team members, we got let go. Well, I have these promises here. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. I will deliver him. So guess what happened? I got delivered and two weeks later I got hired back at the same company in a better department with a son of God for a vice president, um, somebody who's godly, with good people to work with, and 
when they let me go, they also gave me a, a pay package, which I got to keep, even though I got rehired back. So that pay package more than offset this COVID pay reduction. Um, and, and I got a bonus. And even my employees that got let go, HR came to me and said, hey, Bobby, um, um, we have bonus money. Would you like to give your employees who were let go, would you like to give them bonuses? I'm like, yes. And so I even got to give my employees bonuses, ones who were let go. So talk about being delivered and talk about being honored. So God, he loves us. We're his kids. He loves us beyond our imagination. And so when the devil comes to mess with his kids, he's going to save us and he's going to honor us. And so, Daddy, we thank you in Jesus' name. Remember, there's another scripture. Like The reason we're looking up words and looking up definitions and all this stuff is because God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. So however far we can stretch our imagination of his love and his goodwill, he can do that and he can do even much more than that. That's why we're trying to stretch our imagination to have big, good, godly imagination, expecting good things, expecting amazing things. And then, you know, he can work more richly and effectively in our lives. Amen? Let's keep going. So let's go to verse 16. Verse 16. This is a good one. It's all good. With long life, I will, promise, satisfy him and show him my salvation, my Yeshua. Okay, so God, you know, he wraps up Psalm 91 with a promise. I will. Remember, every word, every scripture that's got will or shall, you have found a promise. And if you will believe it, it's yours. Believe it and speak it, it is yours. You know, if there's some requirements that go along with it, in this case of Psalm 91, we need to love God and trust in Him. Then the promise is ours. And He promises to give us a long life. And not a long, miserable life, a long, satisfying life. Nobody wants to live a long, miserable life. That's not what he promises. I will, with long life, I will satisfy him. Not torture you <laughs> with a long, miserable life. I will satisfy you with a long life. Amen? So, this is a promise of God. So, I will live a long and satisfying life. It is mine. It is a promise of God to me and to you. And I will live a long life. I will live a long and healthy life. I will live a long and prosperous life, a long satisfying life, a long fruitful life, and so forth. Okay, and he says, and I will show you my salvation. Okay, so Father promises to give those who love and trust in him satisfying long life. Do not fear premature death. Like We, we don't ever have to worry about death. We don't ever have to worry about our life getting cut short. And we just believe this scripture, you know, it says long life, you know, so, so believe it. You don't have to worry about a plane crashing. You don't have to worry about, you know, a terrorist attack. You don't have to worry about a war. You know, those things may happen around you, but it will not touch you. You will not have a premature death if you believe this passage. Okay. Do not fear sickness. Do not fear accidents. Do not fear tragedy. Do not fear anything at all. Uh, hold on, I gotta go back. There's a word I'm meant to, to talk about. Impregnable. Okay, it says, remember it says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him, I will set him on high because he has known my name. And uh, another way that this I will set on high was translated in this concordant literal version was, because he is attached to me, I shall deliver him, and I shall make him impregnable, impregnable, for he knows my name. So let me show you that word, impregnable. Impregnable. Um, not to be stormed or taken by assault. That cannot be reduced by force. Able to resist attack as an impeg impregnable fortress. Not to be moved, impressed, or shaken. Invincible. Invincible. What's in the title of this teaching? Invincible. Impregnable. Invincible. Out of harm's way. Untouchable. Okay? So I just love that. I love Psalm 91. We are entitled to invincible, untouchable protection. Okay, so I just had to show you that. Now let's go back over here. 
Okay, so now I want to finish reading this. So we shouldn't fear anything at all. If you will believe in Psalm 91, if you will believe in that little phrase in Luke 10, 19, that nothing shall by any means hurt you, then do not fear sickness, do not fear premature death, do not fear accidents, do not fear tragedy, do not fear anything at all. Instead, be confident of long life and realize that you are invincible, you are unkillable, you are unsickable, unharmable, unaccidentable, uninjurable, impregnable, unplagable, uncrimable, unrapable, unrobable, uncalamityable, undisasterable, unviolenceable. And you can make your list as long as you want to. But that's 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 the kind of protection that belongs to us. So let us lay hold of that. And there's nothing better than this. If you are unplagable, then you never need to worry about healing because you're going to walk in health. If you are un, unviolenceable, then you're not going to get shot and worry about dying. You know, if you're un, if you're invincible, then nobody's going to rape you. It doesn't matter if there's a rapist running around the neighborhood. He's not going to get you. The angel of God will kick his bleep if he tries to come towards you. Right, so there, there will be a price to pay for anyone who tries to come upon us. And, and again, if we go back to one of the earlier, either session one or session two on this topic, there was a word uh, for protection where it, the word described it as if a thorny hedge of protection, a thorny hedge. A thorny hedge means that as the evil one's trying to come upon you, like trying to come upon you to do harm, he himself will be harmed by that thorny, spiny form of protection that you have. So when the devil tries to come upon you, he's going to come away um, impaled, injured, hurt, harmed. Like he's going to have a problem when he tries to come towards us. Okay, we're going to be untouched, yet he's going to be harmed because he came against us with ill intent. That's the way it works. Okay, if we will just believe in these passages. Amen? Okay, now let's look at what else he's saying. He's going to give you long life, satisfying life, and in this long and satisfying life, you're going to continually see his salvation. Okay, that word is Yeshua. Okay, it's right here, Yeshua. That's also a variation of the same words, also the, the Hebrew name of Jesus, Yeshua. Because why is he called Yeshua? Because he's a savior. Because he's the source. He's the root cause of all these things. So Jesus' name literally is salvation. Yeshua, it's salvation. Okay, and this word means salvation. It means deliverance, it means welfare, prosperity, victory, aid, help, health, healing. So all this stuff is part of Yeshua. Okay, so you can do your confession like this. I declare in the name of Jesus, I will live a long and satisfying life. I shall experience the full salvation of Jesus Christ. I am always delivered. When the devil comes towards me with something, I am delivered. Even before the evil arrives, I am delivered. I am rescued. I experience perfect welfare in life. I am exempt from misfortune. I am exempt from sickness. I am exempt from calamity. I am exempt from all evil. I prosper in health. I have a blessed life. I have prosperity in life. I have happiness in life. Okay, All that's in this word welfare. I declare in the name of Jesus, I will live a long and satisfying life and I will experience the full salvation of Jesus Christ every day of my life. Therefore, I will prosper in every aspect of life. I shall prosper in health. I shall prosper in faith. I shall prosper in finances. I shall prosper with all needs, always being met with an abundance left over for an abundance of good works. I shall prosper with victory in life. I shall live from victory to victory to victory. I declare in the name of Jesus, I will live a long life, a long satisfying life. I shall experience the full salvation of Jesus Christ every day of my life. Therefore, I shall have the help and the aid and assistance of God in every single thing that I do. Everything that I do has God's help, has God's assistance. Therefore, all things that I do are, are prosperous and successful. And I declare in the name of Jesus, I will live a long, satisfying and healthy life. I shall never be sick. I shall never be harmed. I will live a long life with perfect health. And Jesus paid for the healing of all people. Therefore, I will prosper abundantly in healing the sick and in helping people. Amen. 
Okay, so you could go on and on and on even longer than that, right? So we want to take these passages, we want to just read them aloud, put your name in it ten times, and then convert it into first person and declare it as being true for you. Okay, that's called speaking your faith. And if you believe in your heart and speak out of your mouth, the salvation shall be done. And all these things here, all these amazing words are part of your full salvation. Okay, and this is not even to mention, Psalm 91 doesn't talk anything about eternity. It's all about like physical salvation in this present life on earth. So all this physical, you know, the, the problem with most churches is all they believe in is they get to go to heaven when they die. Well, that doesn't leave you um, much hope for a good existence in this present life of, you know, 80, 90, 120 years, right? But God wants to, he wants to bless us and protect us in the present life and in the future. So the church needs to wake up and expand our understanding of God's goodwill to the present life and into eternity because it includes both. Okay, now I just want to draw your attention. This word welfare, when you, I'm telling you, when you look up words, your faith will be expanded. This little word has an amazing definition. Welfare means exemption from misfortune. Exemption from sickness, exemption from calamity, exemption from evil. Boom! That is amazing. Think about what we just said a minute ago. Impregnable, invincible, seated on high. Where's that definition? To be inaccessibly high. The devil can't get to you. Too high for capturing. The devil can't get to you. Set safely on high, securely on high. The devil cannot touch you. Well, that's the same thing it says here. Exemption from misfortune, exemption from sickness, exemption from calamity, exemption from evil. So our responsibility is to be in a loving relationship with God and believe in what he says here. We need to believe it and speak it, and we shall receive these things. This is an amazing, huge salvation that God gives us. Okay, and this word welfare also has more. It says the enjoyment of health and the enjoyment of the common blessings of life and prosperity and happiness okay so when you look at these words you see that this salvation of Jesus Christ is huge it's phenomenal it's amazing and this is what we need to teach people this is what we we need to believe and experience personally uh, and let others see it and and let our lives be a witness to others that we're un untouchable and protected but we need to be teaching this to others because this is just too good to keep to ourselves all right, then let's look at 2 Corinthians 6.2. So like back in the Old Testament, they were always looking forward to a day of salvation. Like there was some future day. Well, for us, it's present tense. Okay, so he's going to quote Old Testament in capital letters, and then he's going to talk about present tense. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Okay, so that part of the verse, that's a prophesy, a prophecy in the Old Testament pertaining to the days after Jesus was risen. Okay, that's the time we live in. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. That's for us, all this stuff, all Psalm 91, all this amazing definition of Yeshua and welfare, all of that stuff belongs to us right now. Now is the day of Yeshua. Now is the day of this amazing salvation. It's today. There's no future day. It's today and every day. Okay, so we don't want our, our faith in the future. We want our faith in the present tense because Jesus already is risen and all this stuff belongs to us now. There's no Old Testament waiting for a future day. We're, thankfully, we were born in that day. All right? Okay, so let's just talk about some homework and test questions. So originally I like kind of made this as a class, and so it's still a good exercise for us. So number one, take in testimonies continually by reading testimony books, watching testimony videos online, and sharing stories with one another. That's why we start every meeting. We share stories with one another because that boosts our faith because, you know, the Word of God is like thousands of years old, and we can make it present tense when we share stories that are present tense stories. And so faith arises quickly when we do that. Okay, so some things that I like, and I'll show you real quick. Let's come over here. Okay, so on, I like um, Karen Kingsbury. She has a couple little books like 52-week devotional. So there's 52 short stories, 
and they're some of them. These aren't necessarily super miraculous stories. They're, but they are definitely stories of God doing good things for people. And when you read these little short stories, like you know, one or two or three a day, it just keeps your faith and your hope and and your expectation of good things. It keeps it tuned up and fresh, and so it makes it easy to receive from God and experience full salvation when you're constantly having it on your mind by these little stories that you read. Okay, so Karen Kingsbury, um, she has a couple of books. I encourage you to read those. And these stories, they take like three to five minutes to read. So it's easy to read a couple of them a day. Okay, then like Chicken Soup for the Soul, they have several books on miracles. Um, like here's some of the titles like Miracles and Divine Intervention, um, Believe in Miracles, Angels, Book of Miracles, Miracles and More. So there's a bunch of them. And so I've read like many of these. And it's just good like you can have it on your phone or you can order a paper book, whatever you like. And they're not that expensive. And it just keeps your faith fresh. Even though most of them aren't super miraculous, you still see God doing amazing things in these people's lives. And then it, it then that just works with all the scripture that we know. And, and it just improves your faith life, your faith walk. That's good. Okay. Then you can come to Andrew Womack. If you go to um, awmi.net, awmi.net, if you go to watch, then he's got these video stories and you can find healing journeys. And he's probably got 30, 35 healing testimony videos by now. You have these changed lives called destiny stories. You have financial breakthroughs. So he's got all these different kinds of things. The ones that I find most impactful um, would be healing journeys and financial breakthroughs. Um, I'm sure he's got other things in here I haven't seen yet. So these things are good. I mean, it just keeps you tuned up. Okay, so number two, confess scriptures daily. You know, so take Psalm 91 and go through and do scripture confession. And that's one of the best things that you can do. And I, I think that's one of the things that's been most effective in my life is constantly doing scripture confession nearly every day. And number three, put the word of God into practice. Um, you know, we, we need to, oh, I'm sorry, put, we, we do need to put the word of God into practice, but we need to put word study is what I meant to say. We need to put word study into practice because word study will increase our faith when we come upon these amazing words like when it said no evil will befall you. When you look up that word befall, like in the Hebrew, it literally means that no evil will encounter you. No evil is allowed to meet up with you. No, le no evil is allowed to come upon you. That means you're not even going to be touched by the evil, but you're going to be rescued before it touches you. And so to me, that was a phenomenal revelation and a faith builder, which built my faith into being believing in invincibleness. That's a good place to be. You want to be believing in invincible. And then we talked about this word today, set on high. That's the one where you're set on high, where the devil can't reach you. So the word study in the word welfare, when you look at the word welfare, then you see that, you know, exemption from evil, calamity, sickness. Um, that's amazing. So this stretches your faith. So do word study. And a couple of things for word study. Um, I use eSword. It's a free Bible program. And it's, you know, here's a picture of my screen. And you can see I have many different versions of Bible. And one version that comes free, it's called the King James Plus. If you can see that. Let's, well, I'm having a problem. King James Plus. And the plus means it has the Strong's references. Let me see if I can get that magnifying glass to click. Okay. You see these little, um, the little numbers there? Those are, they're called Strong's reference numbers. Okay. So when you click on that little purple number, then it's going to open up uh, the dictionary. And so I use three dictionaries typically. I use Strong's Dictionary for Greek and Hebrew. I use Thayer's Dictionary for Greek. And I use Brown Driver Briggs Dictionary for Hebrew. And all three of these are free. Okay, and so when you click on that, that little purple number there, it's going to pull up the definition of the word. And here you can see Yeshua, which is that word in the verse 16 of Psalm 91. And you can see the definition. Um, you know, salvation, deliverance, welfare, prosperity, deliverance, salvation by God, victory. Okay, and so this is very easy to use. It's very fast, very efficient. It makes word study super easy. And it's all free. Free Bible software, free dictionaries, free, free, free. It's good. 
Okay. Then another thing that I do, especially if I'm studying the New Testament and you know trying to clarify understandings around topics like eternal, you know what we read in our Bible, eternal condemnation, eternal fire, etc. Um, you'll find that that's all misunderstanding, and it's because of largely in part because of misunderstanding of particular words. And so words change in meaning over time. Like in our day and age, for example, uh, if somebody says the word gay, the first thing you think of is a homosexual person, right? That's what gay means. Well, it didn't mean that 50 years ago. Gay meant happy, right? So words evolve in meaning over time. That's not something new in our lifetime that words change meaning. That's something that's happened throughout all of time. And so what happens is, that when you read a, a Bible translation that's you know translated in the last you know couple centuries, the, the definitions of words have changed. And so what you can do is you can use this Legion University of Chicago EDU website and you can look up ancient definitions of Greek words, what they meant in the day of Jesus. And you'll be shocked that some of the words that you think you know what they mean, they mean something different. Um, and so um, this is important to use especially when you're looking at so-called eternity words in the Bible um, you'll find that the definition of ion, ionios, it actually doesn't mean eternity by necessity it means an unspecified amount of time an age of time and so that completely changes doctrine um, in a positive way so anyway so those are some of the things that I use as far as resources for word study okay then some questions that are good to kind of work through and some actions you know, think about think about Psalm 91 there were some requirements for us in order to be protected by God what what are they am, am I fulfilling those requirements am I clinging to God am I attached to God am I trusting in him am I loving him you know, so there was a few requirements that we looked at and number five write a letter to someone to describe this complete protection that we have as described in Psalm 91 Okay, send this to various people and then also teach it directly to people. You know, so it's good to like put pen to paper or to type a letter because when you take the time to actually write something out, it causes you to think about it more deeply and intentionally and you take your time with it. And so when you actually write up a letter trying to convince somebody of this amazing salvation that Psalm 91 describes, you're going to be increased in faith as a result of doing that. Just like every time I put together a teaching, I am strengthened in faith because I have to sit there and think about it. I have to look things up. I have to meditate on it. And so every time you're putting your mind to putting something into a written form, then you're going to increase. And so there's a benefit for you, and there's definitely a benefit for the people that you would send it to. Okay, so you want to do the pen to paper kind of thing, but you also want to teach it, preach it to people as well. And every time... Remember, there's a law of sowing and reaping, and it applies to everything. So as you're sowing understanding, you're also reaping understanding, right? And so that's a good thing. And we want to constantly be sharing what God has taught us, be sharing it with others through however you can do it. Okay, and then number six, think about, you know, what are some of the new things you learned today and in the prior two sessions? What did you learn from word studies? What incremental understanding did you get about protection, about salvation? You know, so just think about that and then share these learnings with others. And every time we share, we're also strengthening ourselves. Amen? Now I want to wrap up with one more thing. So we have our friend, um, Pastor Rogers, and uh, he's in Uganda. He has a church called Back to Jesus Church. And uh, I want to tell you an example about um, Psalm 91 protection coming true. And let's just read this again. It says in verses 9 to 12, because Pastor Rogers has made the Lord his refuge, even the Most High his dwelling place, no evil shall befall Pastor Rogers. No plague shall come near Pastor Rogers' dwelling. For God shall give his angels charge over Pastor Rogers to protect him in all of his ways. And in the hands of our Father's angels, they shall bear up, they shall, keep that in mind, in the hands of the angels they shall bear up Pastor Rogers, lest Pastor Rogers dash his foot against a stone. Okay, so think about that. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Alright, so you see this pit here? 
first of all, notice here's the level of the street. You see that? That's the level of the street. Here is a pit. And you see this guy is standing and his head's not poking out the top of the pit. You see that? He's standing. This pit is like, I don't know, six feet deep. Um, this is the guy that was driving the motorcycle. And Pastor Rogers was riding on the back of the motorcycle. And, you know, Pastor Rogers, he believes in Psalm 91. And what happened is they were driving at night. Uh, they were driving at night down the road. And, and, and oncoming car's lights went into the driver's eyes and he couldn't see. And then he ran off in this ditch. And when he ran off in the ditch, Rogers flew off the motorcycle and landed on his feet, was unharmed, untouched, unscathed, and his clothes did not even get dirty. No evil shall befall you. That is true. No plague shall come near your dwelling. That is true. He shall give his angels charge over you to protect you in all of your ways. That is true. In the hands of the angels, they picked up Rogers and set him on the other side of the pit on his feet, unharmed. No injury, no scratches, no bruises, no pain, no harm, not even dirt on his clothes. Amen. All right, well, guys, that's it for today. So take Psalm 91, believe it, confess it, be speaking it. And just as Marlene had a testimony about it today, it is true. It is true. We just need to believe it and speak it, and we shall have it. So God bless you all, and y'all have an amazing weekend.